Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us to enjoy an evening with Sown in the Stars author, Dr. Sarah Hall. This evening's lecture is a joint presentation of the Berry Center's Agrarian Literary League and the Agrarian Voices Lecture Series and has been made possible thanks to the generous support of the Josephine Ardery Foundation, Jenny Harrod, Jeff Ricketts and Tony Perry, and Cindy and Scott Anderson. I would like to begin by sharing a little information about our 2023 Agrarian Literary League programming. Since its beginning in 2017, the Agrarian Literary League has given away nearly 2,500 books to Henry County residents as part of our work to foster the preservation of local histories, strengthen pride and stewardship of place, and conserve our rural culture. If you have not already, you are welcome to pick up a free copy of this year's Agrarian Literary League book, River of Earth by James Still. Each book comes with a reader's guide and bookmark. For those watching online, you can visit berrycenterbookstore.com to purchase a copy. Sales of River of Earth through the bookstore at the Berry Center help make nights like this possible. Now, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Sarah Hall. Dr. Hall is Associate Professor of Agriculture and Natural Resources at Berea College. Her scholarly articles on the restoration of native forests and grasslands in Kentucky have been published in a wide range of journals, including Restoration Ecology and New Forests. Her most recent book is entitled Sown in the Stars, Planting by the Signs. Through this beautiful book, Dr. Hall shares with readers the practice of farming and gardening by celestial cycles. Her book serves as a guide, an oral history, visual ethnography, and lends a respectful scientist's eye to an ancient practice. If I may quote from Ronnie Lundy's forward to this book, neither a science nor a method of magic, sign systems might best be interpreted as a language indicative of the profound connections our ancestors felt to the stars, moon, and planets above them, and the earth they lived on below. It's a language we stand to lose as we increasingly encase our lives in metal and concrete, our eyes and attention focused on machines. The history and mystery of the signs ask us to consider whether planting, indeed living, in conversation and harmony with the vast natural world around us might provide much more than bumper crops and perfectly fermented sour corn. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Hall. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for that lovely introduction, and thank you for the warm welcome um, that I've received. I had a lovely um, dinner over at the tavern beforehand, um, and yeah, just I have always really admired um, all of the work coming out of the Berry Center, and uh, just feel really honored uh, to be here to share about this project with you all. So thanks for taking the time, um, both to invite me to, um, to the Berry Center folks and to all of you for coming this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, so I will, um, I'll be reading a little bit from the book. I'll also be sharing some audio clips from the interviews that I did, um, sharing some of the photos as well. Um, and then we should have you know, plenty of time for some question and answer at the end. Um, so I'm gonna start um, with, uh, and I'll just mention this is the, the table of contents here. I'm maybe gonna touch a little bit on the introduction actually, the basics. Um, and I might talk a little bit about differences between some of the al almanacs and calendars. Um, and I'll sort of use today as an example of the signs, where the, what signs we're in according to what calendars and what you should do. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of a roadmap of where, where we're headed. Um, so I'm gonna start here just a little bit from the introduction. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. So. Um, every Sunday of my childhood, we would go to church in the morning, then head to my granny's place for the rest of the day. 
That drive took me from relatively flat central Kentucky into the rolling hills of the Knobs, the transition into the Appalachian Mountains. My granny lived in Estill County along a ridge top known as Sand Hill, a stone's throw from a big curve in the Kentucky River. My memories of those days are incredibly rich. They were filled with explorations in the woods that fostered in me a desire to learn and understand more about the complexities of the natural world. The smells coming from the stove and the oven were always plentiful and foreshadowed tastes that testified to my granny's skill as a cook. Her ability to cover the stove top and fill the oven without a single misstep continues to leave me in awe as I sometimes struggle to make half the number of dishes she did. My cousins became my friends as we explored the pastures, forests, and creeks surrounding us. I heard stories while breaking beans or peeling apples that implanted family roots from a very different time. One that still sticks out in my mind is my granny's argument with the electric company about cutting down some sugar maple trees that my grandfather, who had died well before then, had so caringly planted. And that was when the electric initially came through. Another thing I remember is the gardens I saw on our drive to my granny's. Freshly plowed soil marked the coming spring more consistently than any date on the calendar, school vacation, or even Easter. The newly exposed soil declared to everyone that there would be sweat and toil to come, but most of all, there would be food. The further we got from the highway, the denser those blank garden canvases became. As the spring wore on, the paint appeared and occasionally a gardening artist could be spotted at work. I took note of the different styles of gardening and wondered about some of the plants I didn't recognize. I noticed how each garden had its own character or personality, a reflection of the artists themselves. Some plots were meticulously groomed and orderly, with staked strings to ensure straight rows during planting, while others were a bit more freeform and whimsical. The structures for supporting beans varied greatly. Many featured tobacco sticks as the primary structure, sometimes with strings attached, while others used long bamboo poles or branches recovered from the forest floor. Each garden had a unique arrangement that was perfect in its own way. One thing I knew for sure was that just like the garden at my granny's, those rows of vegetables would become staples for winter meals, stored wherever there was space, whether on a shelf or under a bed, to provide nourishment while the garden slept. And as the winter progressed, the once filled jars would be replaced with empties, ready for next year's harvest. Um, so um, just a little bit of sort of background about how the project um, came to be. I teach at Berea, um, and this came out of a class called Appalachian Plants and People um, that explores various um, ways that plants have been used um, in the Appalachian region. And um, in preparing for that course, you know, I ended up reading a lot in the Foxfire books, lots of other um, information, and I sort of just got um, this idea of planting by the signs became uh, really fascinating to me. And then um, I was working, well, I should, step, uh, I should step back, sorry. I've gone off script by reading and now I'm all thrown off. But um, so a number of years ago, I was working at, the, at Kentucky State University um, prior to starting at Berea. And um, this man, Mr. John Clay, actually stopped by and gave me some seeds and he told me that if I planted them under a certain sign, they would go an inch deeper in the soil than at any other time. Um, and so that was sort of the, that was, uh, I don't remember exactly when he said I was supposed to plant them, but I just remember that he said <laughs> that if I planted them at a certain time, they would go a lot deeper than at others. Um, and I actually, as I was starting to think about what I wanted to do for my sabbatical project um, in 2018 and 2019, um, this idea of planting by the signs became, um, I became really intrigued uh, by it, and, um, and I actually found those seeds in the bottom of my seed box um, that I had gotten from him so long ago. I never had planted them, but I did the year that I did the project. Um, I, d I was able to plant them, but um, so the book is sort of dedicated to Mr. John Clay and my granny, um, who you can tell from that intro sort of how that um, inspiration came from. So that's kind of how the project came to be, um, and 
I guess I'm going to play, this is a real brief audio clip from um, Gary Easton of Gallatin County, um, and I interviewed him and his wife, uh, Goldie, they're now in Berea, but when you hear him say her and we, that's who, she, who he's referring to because it was um, him and Goldie together that I interviewed. When we grew up there, and, and uh, my wife and I have, have lived there all of our lives, um, growing up in her family and my family, our parents were concerned about signs. Uh, our primary cash crop when we were growing up was tobacco. And uh, there were certain times of the year when the signs were uh, not good for planting tobacco. Uh, both her parents and my parents uh, agreed on the same thing. There were certain days that you just didn't plant tobacco. And that carried over into, even now we're, we're not involved in tobacco at all and haven't been for years, uh, that carried over into our lives and the gardening and the flower garden process. So uh, we, we held on to that. Uh, we, we do plant uh, gardens um, and flowers. Uh, mm -hmm. We we trim fruit trees by the signs of the moon and the signs of the zodiac. If you want to refer to that, so it's it's been an important part of our background growing up, and and it still is today. Maybe not a a lot of scientific proof, but it's traditions that's carried down from grandparent to parents to children. Right. Okay, so I like that little um, audio clip to sort of uh, encapsulate um, the, what it is, essentially. Okay, um, so I always like to start off with um, just acknowledgement and uh, great, you know, gratitude, being grateful to the people that I um, interviewed, first and foremost, and then I'll mention uh, some others. Uh, it is no secret that Appalachia and its people have often been portrayed through a less than flattering lens. To those who deeply love their home and their way of life, allowing a stranger in, along with a voice recorder and a camera no less, is a large ask. Despite this, I was repeatedly met with warmth, pride, and an eagerness to share. With this book, it is my intention to present both the people who participated in this fascinating practice with deep respect. I couldn't possibly capture the complexity of the lived experiences of each individual within these pages, but I've done my best to provide a small glimpse and to pass on what they shared with me. I'm greatly indebted to all those who allowed me into their homes or gardens and added their voices to this project. I still go to my granny's place occasionally, although she is no longer with us. Some of those fully painted garden canvases I remember from my childhood are still evident on the drive, and some new ones have appeared but many are no longer there. This project was my opportunity to get a behind the scenes look into the skills, knowledge, and stories of those who are growing food and keeping tradition alive in Appalachia. In some cases, the artists were no longer able to paint their own garden canvases, but their memories were still fresh enough to share the process with the rest of us. In other cases, I was able to witness the painting in progress during a snapshot in time. One thing I noted in all my interviews was that women were responsible for handing down the practice of planting by the signs. Most of the men I interviewed had been taught by their wives, mothers, or grandmothers. And for the women I interviewed, it was the same. They learned the practice from the women in their lives. Um, so uh, in addition to all of the folks that I interviewed um, and people who connected me with them, so I had, um, you know, former students who connected me with their family members or staff members at the college and just various, you know, I would talk to somebody and they would say, well, you should really talk to this person. And um, in addition to all of those folks, um, Meg Wilson, who did the photography for the book, um, that was really a huge piece. Um, and I think, um, I'll just mention that when I initially approached Meg for the book, I just wanted a portrait for everybody that I was interviewing. That was all I wanted was a portrait. <laughs> um, and Meg shoots with a film camera and I was uh, paying out of pocket to get all of that 
uh, developed, which is which was fine. But she kept taking all these other pictures, you know, <laughs> while we were going out, and I was sort of like, Ugh. Um, but I'm so glad she did because they just enrich. Um, the book so very much, and I'm just really thankful for her artistry um, in in the work that's included in there. So, um, yeah, Meg did really great. The University Press of Kentucky um, and my editor Patrick O'Dowd were supportive throughout the whole thing, even when, um, I, as I was telling Michelle, <laughs> until I got the foreword from Ronnie, I still was feeling like I have no idea if this is at all anything that anybody's gonna wanna read. If it's horrible, I don't really know. Um, but they were really supportive throughout the process. Um, and Heather Dent uh, at Berea did a number of the illustrations that you'll get to look at um, too, so yeah. All right, so we're gonna have to get a little bit into the you know, the basics of this stuff. So what, is it, what does it mean? What are, the, what are the signs? What are they based on? So, Okay, so we're gonna talk, talk about the moon cycle for just a minute. Um, so the moon orbits the earth with a complete cycle taking 28 days more or less. And I didn't know until I wrote this book that it's debatable how long it takes for the moon to go, but it is actually, it depends on how you calculate it and all kinds of weird stuff. You can look at the notes if you wanna, if you wanna get into that. Um, the visible part of the moon, that is the part that faces the earth or the near side, remains the same during its revolution. The moon's backdrop or location in the sky relative to the Earth changes as it orbits, and the moon's orientation to the sun changes, um, which is what is being shown here. The moon's orientation to the sun dictates how much of the moon is visible or lit in the night sky. Thus, from a given point on Earth, the moon looks a bit different during each day of its 28 or so day orbit. The visible change is known as the phases of the moon. In addition to the specific phases of the moon, this cycle is divided into quarters. The first quarter is the week between the new moon and the first quarter moon, so essentially this kind of top right quadrant here that we're looking at. Um, and during this time, the visible portion of the moon is increasing or waxing. The second quarter includes the week between the first quarter moon and the full moon, that top left quadrant. And during this quarter, the moon is still waxing or growing. The first and second quarters together, or the top half, are often termed the light or growing moon. So people that I interviewed would talk about it um, in that way. The week between the full moon and the last quarter moon, that bottom left quadrant, is termed the third quarter, and during this time the visible portion is decreasing or waning. And finally, the fourth quarter encompasses the, the time from the last quarter moon to the new moon, or the bottom right. The third and fourth quarters together, that whole bottom half, are often termed the dark moon, and the fourth quarter is sometimes referred more specifically as the old moon. Um, and so at the really basic level, you've got these two halves of the cycle, right? So from new to full, and then from full to new. Um, and at a really basic, at the most basic level, you wanna plant above ground crops in that top half and below ground crops in that bottom half. So anything that produces below the ground that you harvest would be, you would wanna hit it between that full and new. Um, okay, but it does get more specific to that because then we have to get into the signs. Uh, but before we do that, I'm gonna play this little audio clip. Um, this is Jane Post of Madison County. Um, and I'll just mention, because I think, she, well, yeah, she does refer to it in this clip. She uses this Llewellyn's Moon Sign book. Um, so when she's talking about this spelling it out, that's what she's talking about is uh, the Llewellyn's Moon Sign book that she uses. The, the main thing is that there's the phases of the moon, so the first, second, third, and fourth quarter. And each quarter has um, it's something that you plant and um, or... Um, event that you do in the gardening. So the first quarter um, you would plant annuals, the second quarter you're planting like stuff that produces fruit, the third quarter it would be bulbs and roots, and the fourth quarter you're cultivating and destroying your pests. Okay, and she'll come back and get, um, yeah, we'll hear another clip from her where she gets even a little more specific. Okay. All right, so um, just now we were looking at this particular part, right? The moon's um, 
revolution around the Earth. Now we're going to sort of um, zoom out, zoom out from there and think about more broadly what's going on. Okay, so early observations confirmed that the sun appeared to move along a certain path during the Earth's 365 day year. The moon's orbit around the Earth, as well as the movement of other planets, appeared to follow the same path. This was evident by the sighting of different patterns of stars or constellations near the moon at different times during its approximately monthly revolution. Around the 5th century BCE, the Babylonians designated this path, which extended 8 degrees above and below the sun's path, and divided the entire belt into 12 30-degree slices of the 365-degree pi. They named the stellar constellations within the belt based on the shapes they resembled, nearly all of which were animals, according to their, um, how they saw them, and they called the belt the zodiac. When considering the differences and similarities between astrology and astronomy, the zodiac is a great case study. Astronomers and astrologers agree that the Earth orbits the sun in an ecliptic and that the moon orbits the Earth in approximately the same plane. They also agree that within the zo zodiacal belt, there are collections of stars that can be identified as the named constellations. However, the astronomer will point out that the widths of these constellations differ. Thus, precise 30 degree in increments are irrelevant and, there, and that there are additional constellations within the zodiac besides the 12 used by astrologers. The astronomer will also point out that due to the precession of the equinoxes, which you can, there's a different se section on that, um, the constellations are no longer oriented to the Earth and the Sun in the same way they were when the Babylonians envisioned the zodiac. Um, so the sort of, the key part there is that, um, you know, astronomy and astrology have a common have common roots, right? But they are different in that um, astrology, in this case, just evenly divides that this whole pie for the twelve different signs or constellations. Even though, you know, if it's actually if we're thinking about what's happening in the sky, you would it would vary more. Um, and there are some calendars and almanacs that do that. So. Um, the biodynamic um, almanac and calendar is the one that does that. It actually um, will vary the degree for it, for the individual constellations. I think the range is something like uh, 10 to up to like 45 degrees. Um, so it's a really wide range that's actually dependent on the size of the constellations. Um, so, but most calendars don't do that. They just simply, you know, um, divide it up. Although. Also, all of the almanacs essentially say, you know, our, um, let's see, our system for calculating these things is proprietary, but it's the best one to use our almanac, right? Like that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what is common among all of them is they will say you should use ours. Um, okay, so now we get into the signs um, and how those constellations um, link to these things. Um, and I'll just mention that pretty much everybody that I interviewed um, referred to the signs by the body part names, right, as opposed to like the constellation names. Um, and so each one has a, a body part association. Okay, so I gotta find my right thing here. Okay. It's not entirely clear when the almanac man or zodiac man or man of signs, uh, he is always a man though, I'll mention, <laughs> came into being. The Greeks are typically credited with assigning each of the zodiacal constellations to a body part, as these astrologers believed each constellation had influence over a certain part of the body. Depictions of this idea abound from various parts of the world. Um, at various times. Some of the earliest records are from the Hellenistic period, although cuneiform records may predate these. The body part associations are consistent over time. These ideas form the basis of medical astrology or astrological medicine. Among the people interviewed for the project, the vast majority, as I said, referred to the signs by the body part names. All almanacs and many calendars include a version of the almanac man, and many calendars use the body part names for the days. Um, thus, the almanac man remains an important part of the custom of planting by the signs, even thousands of years after his inception. 
So the table there um, has the sign or the constellation name, if you want to think about it that way, the body part name, and then the symbol. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of, it's a little bit like learning a, um, a new language a little bit to learn how to uh, interchange those things because sometimes the calendars will only have the symbol, for instance, right? They won't have um, the name there. Um, or sometimes it's just the body part name uh, and you're trying to figure out what that is referring to. Um, so, but that gets us a little bit um, understanding kind of what, what the signs are referring to. Um, and the signs always go in the same order. Um, and they sort of, but the, the complicating part is that, uh, so the, here it starts in the head and then moves down the body and then down into the feet is where it ends. But it's not, um, it doesn't start in the head at the same phase of the moon consistently, if that makes sense. So you can have any of these in any phase of the moon. And ideally you're matching both the phase of the moon and a favorable sign or a good sign. Um, so, you know, for your below ground, you want to hit both a good sign and also hit it in that half of the moon cycle. So that, that can get a little bit uh, confusing. Um, here I wanted to show this uh, photo of uh, Bill Best holding one of his uh, many, 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 many heirloom beans. This is his noble bean. Um, this, I like to show this image because it didn't actually make it into the book. We submitted it as a cover photo and um, they did a wonderful, like the press did a really great job of uh, finding a designer to do the beautiful uh, cover, but it meant that when we said, well, can we get that picture back in? They were like, nope. <laughs> so, so I said, well, I can at least share it when I, um, when I am, sh am talking about the book. Um, another reason, so it's a really lovely image and also, um, the, the press also did a much better job at coming up with the title of the book. So my working title had been Beans in the Arms um, because that's one of the arms or Gemini or the twins um, is when many people will say you should plant your beans. Um, and so this kind of had like, you know, double meaning for that. Um, but I will, it is not, I mean, it's interesting because it's not universal that everybody says you should plant your beans in the arms. Um, some people, and, and it's not universal like in the written um, sources either, although a lot of them will say you should. So this little audio clip I'm gonna play is actually Mary Overby of Laurel County, and, um, and you'll hear her take on that. When we were growing up, Mom would plant the beans and when the signs was in the arms, twin days. Mm -hmm. But I always try to plant mine with cancer breast. Okay. It's the best time that I know of to plant them. And then the secrets. Actually, the secrets are better than the cancer breast, but that's the two best signs. <laughs> well, I, I don't like to plant beans on twin days. They just curl up in the ground and won't come to the ground. A lot of them don't. Hmm. Which old people used to plant them in them days all the time, but I never have liked that. So you switched because you had mm -hmm. you had some failures? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, um, so that's Mary's take on it. Um, she actually differed from what her mom did. Um, another person that I interviewed, um, Phil Case, who's in Frankfurt, um, he actually writes a, a column in the State Journal regularly on this topic, and he has a Facebook page, and he may be on Twitter or whatever, whatever it's called, yeah, <laughs> whatever it is these days. Um, I, I, but he um, he has run for a very long time the column on planting by the signs, um, and he talked about how we have a lot of twin days or Gemini days, um, but we don't have a lot that will fall in that correct half of the phase of the moon. Um, and he talks about one of the first years that he gardened. Um, they had that when he, well, when he first learned about planting by the signs from his neighbor um, and they planted the garden, they had those things line up. And he said, you know, he and his wife, they, they picked beans and they picked beans and they canned and they froze and they, and he said, finally, we just ripped up the plants because you can only eat so many beans, you know? And um, so he seemed to, to think that if you can get that, both hit that sign and have it in the right phase that, um, that it really does work well. So uh, again, sort of 
um, not exact, not everybody agrees, but um, a lot of people will say that's when you should plant your beans. Um, this is gonna be a short, I think it's like a four minute um, little clip that Meg actually put together with a number of photos that she took um, from our interviews with uh, this, these three, it's a three generations of um, women in this family um, who do this. And we, you'll notice we visited them two different times because the first time we went, um, it had gotten dark. I think we were there like in December, so it was dark by the time we got there and Meg wanted to go back and get some nice natural light portraits um, of them. So there's pictures from both of those visits in here. So to start off, Ken, we'll go around and if you can each tell me your uh, full name, including maiden, if applicable, and your date of birth, if you don't mind. Abby Turner Walker, 41965. Sarah Epperson Hinkle, 121285. Myrtle Turner, 1934. All right. And um, Myrtle, can you describe where we are right now? You and Big Laura in Harlan County. Um, That's Myrtle's dog. Lynn Park from Harlan County and Big Law from Turkey. So we're five miles from the Pine Middle Settlement School. Great. Can you tell me about farming or gardening? How did you learn about it? And you guys can all just... Just had to work in the fields with your dad, didn't you? Uh, didn't you had to work in the fields with your dad? Yes, I had, we had worked in the fields with our dad. <laughs> we had to hold corn, we had to plant corn, we had to plant beans, we had to pick beans, and we had to camp and we had done everything. Mm -hmm. Milk cows and feed cows and <laughs> churn, make butter. <laughs> Wish we found somebody to make butter name. <laughs> Well, I probably learned that on my own because my dad, is, like I said, my dad, he said he didn't believe in the sun. He believed in planting in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, I guess my mother-in-law, she never planted nothing that she, you know, went science. And so she always raised a, you know, good garden and everything. So I think can or anything, and she went for the science because she canned a lot. And I, I do, too. Like I say, if you crawl, you've you tried that, eh? Mm-hmm. What did it do? Uh, well, no, I didn't do crawl that way. Uh, I did beans and tomatoes in a double whammy, and that it was the signs were in the bowels, and I was menstruating, and I thought, well, scientifically, I'm admitting something, so I wore gloves the entire time. I never touched anything, and they looked good for about a day or two. I didn't have a picture of it. I put it in my favorite so I can show you guys what they did. Hmm. Um, and my mom came up to the house a few days later. I had them sitting on the counter and she said, you gonna learn to listen to me, ain't you? And they walked <laughs> off. That's the only comment she had. <laughs> well, if you, I mean, if you, if you don't believe, just try it and see. Mm -hmm. The beans sprouted in the jar and became milky and the tomatoes separated. But I like in the bales, I don't do it, and I mostly in the knees <coughs> or thighs. I don't do it in the head. Uh, breast is, is a time is to do it. Um, the only thing we've ever, we usually do when signs are in the head is weeding. It's a killing sign. Mm -hmm. Feet, and you can do it in the feet. And don't get dental work yeah. in the head either. It's not good to do it in the feet because see, it's not long till it's going out. And uh, well, mm -hmm. if, I don't know if the girls read the Bible or not. The Bible says there's time to plant, you know, time to everything. Mm -hmm. Time to plant and time to harvest. Of course, yes. And all that. Mm -hmm. So, when you think about it, we have a lot of stuff like to look at, like weather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your signs, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. The mountains around you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When things grow, you know. Yeah. The saps up, saps down. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll make the tonics too, like out of. Okay. I'm going to end that one there. Um, well, yeah, it was such a 
such a joy to meet with those three. Um, I got to see Sarah at um, a talk I did down in Hazard maybe a couple months ago, um, and she got really emotional watching that because her aunt, Abby, um, has passed away since, and she hadn't heard her voice since. Um, but she was, she was really grateful and, and um, appreciated having that, um, which, was, which was good. Um, all right. Okay, so um, as an example for sort of where the signs are right now, um, we are currently in the fourth quarter. Um, so we're in that last piece that some people will call the old moon. Um, and then which sign we're in depends on which reference you look at. Um, but most of them say that we are currently in Virgo or the bowels is the body part name for those. And you just heard in that video that you definitely don't want to make your kraut if it's in the bowels <laughs> or do any kind of preserving. Um, because, um, yeah, everybody says that like your sauerkraut will get dark and go stinky and it's, it's, yeah, you don't want to do it if it's in the bowel. So I don't know if anybody started kraut today, but good luck <laughs> if you did. Um, and yeah, so most of the sources say that that's where we are. Um, the one, the farmer's hyphen almanac, which is the orange one, this one um, actually has that we've moved on into Libra or the rains, which is the next one. Um, so again, it sort of depends on how they, calculate these things exactly. Um, it's interesting in that, I mean, there are a lot of times when the biodynamic um, almanac, which as I mentioned is more sort of astronomically based, so it, it's more what is actually happening. There are times when it lines up like it does today with um, Llewellyn's and the old farmer's almanac, um, but then there's other times where it will vary too. Um, and I'll just mention that the the biodynamic um, almanac is different, not just in how it calculates things, but also there are no universally like bad or killing signs in the biodynamic one. So um, you mentioned, you heard um, Sarah mention like that the head or Aries is a killing sign, so they only do weeding. There are not any like killing signs um, according to the biodynamic one. Um, each one is designated as either a leaf. Uh, fruit, root, or flower sign. So whatever type of sign it is would be favorable for those parts of the plant, essentially. So it, it differs um, quite a bit in that, um, in that way. Um, but yes, you heard about, um, about Virgo and the bowels. Um, I will, I'll, it's a very short little section here that I'll read on this. Um, so Debbie Cook from Letcher County, she said, we never planted anything when it was in the sign of the bowels. My mother-in-law said, never, no matter what. You know, I don't even think we worked in the garden then when it was in the sign of the bowels. Um, so they sort of treated it as one of those uh, kind of killing signs. Um, five people interviewed brought up Virgo and all warned against planting any vegetables under this sign. Four published sources and two people interviewed referred to Virgo as being favorable for planting flowers. But as with Leo, gardening activities should generally be confined to controlling plant or animal pests. One calendar says of Virgo, quote, never plant or your seeds will rot, end quote. Medicinal plants are mentioned in one source as being favored in Virgo. More so than any other sign, Virgo came up in the interviews with regard to preserving or canning with clear warnings against, or with clear warnings to avoid doing so. The biodynamic calendar designates Virgo a root sign. Um, so it says if you are planting a root crop, then it would be good for that. All right. So um, with that, I've got my final little slide here. Um, and then I'll be happy to take some questions from you all. Um, I just have to figure out where. Okay. Here we go. Um, just a super short little piece here. Um, there are, of course, countless other garden artists not included in this book. If you know some of them, I hope you will take the time to ask them questions, listen to their stories, and record them yourself. And I hope everyone reading this book will be inspired to get out and put some seeds in the ground or in a tub of potting soil on the porch. While written text and audio recordings are powerful tools in preserving this art, there is even more to be said for the act of getting out and becoming an artist yourself. 
So um, I think I will uh, stop there. And I will just mention that all of the audio recordings are available um, online on the Berea College Archives website. So if you just Google Berea College Archives Planting by the Signs, you'll find all of those. There's over 18 hours. Um, there's also transcripts, which took forever. And so if you want to like search, you know, you could even search for terms if you're really interested in something. Um, and uh, yeah, you can find those interviews there. Um, yeah, they're worth a, worth a listen. They're pretty interesting. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Um, Uh, if you would pass your cards, if you have any questions, pass them to the end of your aisle in Virginia. We'll pick them up and then we'll put you on the spot. Oh, it's so fantastic. <laughs> cards. <laughs> do they have to fill out a card to get their points for today? That's what I make my students um, do. No. <laughs> I have a statement. The, uh, the old uh, stone foundations of the houses, they were... Uh, Set by the moon, also. Mm -hmm. in yep. Uh, so that they wouldn't sink into the ground. They yep. Would stay on the surface. Yep, um, yeah, and that's so there's a chapter called Beyond Planting that talks about um, a number of things, including that. Um, and and the general um, the general idea there is sort of the same with those two halves of the phases of the moon. So you mm -hmm. want to have. Um, like if you're gonna lay gravel or lay stone and you want it to stay on the top, then you want it to be in that top half. Um, and if you do it in the bottom half, then the idea is that it will sort of be you this know, all swallowed. To gravitation there you go. Okay. <laughs> Come on, it's the yeah. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, here's the question. Have you learned anything about livestock management using the signs, castrating, dehorning, Etc. Yes. Yes. So there is um, there is a section in that chapter on those things, um, and the general idea with those is the same as for. Um, I wish I knew who asked the question. Who asked the? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, yes. So the general idea is that you would do it um, when the sign is away from the body part that is being worked on, right? Um, so, and it's the same with surgery in, in people. So um, you may have heard Sarah mention dental work, for instance, you don't wanna get dental work done when the signs are in the head. The idea is that there's more bleeding, like that the blood flows more to that part of the body. And so if you have that done, um, then there's gonna be more, um, yeah, there's gonna be more bleeding and it's gonna be harder to recover from it. Um, so yeah, with castrating, um, sort of, I think what I was told in interviews was like, ideally it would be like knees down, which is the same for weaning, when you wean animals. Um, and that one came up a number of times too, that if it's in the right sign, um, Joe Trigg said, if it's in the right sign, like basically start it when the signs are in the knees and then when it gets down to the feet, which is gonna be basically like a six to seven day window, right, for that period, he said, once you get through that, like, the mamas and the babies are all done with each other. They're like, you know, it is time and we're done. Whereas if you do it in the wrong sign, they're gonna ball and ball and ball and your neighbors are gonna be calling and you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, did companion planting cross over into many of the Kentucky um, interviews? Yeah, that's a good question. And it didn't, that's not one that really came up very much. Um, what, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a separate thing, but there were certain days that uh, people said that you were supposed to plant certain things that was not the signs, but was a certain day, like Valentine's Day for your peas. Maybe some of you have heard that before, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Good Friday um, mm -hmm. as a day that you should do things, but not, um, yeah, there wasn't, I didn't really hear much about, you know, planting certain crops with others. Um, what was the biggest obstacle when you were doing uh, the writing, the oral history and the writing? I think was there something that tripped <sighs> yeah. you up? Yeah. Um, A lot. I mean, the hardest, the hardest thing to me was writing um, 
sort of the brief biographical sketches that became the chapter called The Followers, um, just because, you know, I had a very limited window and interaction with people, and I wanted to be able to kept, capture sort of, you know, who they are. Um, and I also just felt this, like, great sense of, you know, duty and getting it right, <laughs> of like, oh, I don't want to mess this up. Um, so I really, I tried to work on those, like, pretty soon after the, I mean, in some cases, like, right after the interview. I, like, tried to start writing things down just because I thought I would forget some of it. Um, or, you know, I might not be able to read my notes or whatever, and I wanted to get stuff right. Um, one of the readers uh, actually suggested, one of the readers, you know, that the publisher sent it out to suggested that I send the manuscript out to everybody. Um, and I did, and I'm so, I'm glad I did for a number of reasons. Um, at the time, it felt like, well, this is gonna delay everything about six months, which it did, but, um, but also a number of people passed away between when they got that, you know, that version and when the book actually came out. And so I'm so glad that I was able, so, you know, to get it uh, to those folks. Um, yeah, to get them to be able to see it. Um, have you heard of any folklore regarding eclipse and crops? Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good question. I, that, it did not really come up in any of the interviews when I was doing research for the book and trying to find scientific evidence, you know, for, <laughs> for this stuff, um, what I could find is a couple of papers that were related to like sap flow and eclipses. Um, mm -hmm. And some of those, I mean, I think one, I could only read the abstract because it was in German, and but the abstract had been translated. Um, but there is, there is a little bit of scientific research showing that, you know, the natural systems respond to eclipses, but not necessarily related to kind of the signs and question. when you would plant. There's a, there's a, um, in, since the moon, since like the celestial energy is believed to be mediated by the moon, when there's an eclipse, there's like a cutting off of the, of the flow of that celestial energy. So like in a, a lot of, um, like medieval and ancient sources, the eclipse is believed to like cut off the life energy which flows down from the heavens. So like a lot of people believe it was really harmful to plants and crops. Yeah. And I did, and, and not here, in, it's not from Kentucky, but I, I had a, um, I'm a farmer, I had a, a fellow work for me who was from Mexico and he, I put it on my card there, he uh, told me that they used to hang um, horseshoes in the trees in the orchard protect them from being damaged from eclipses. And interesting. And interesting, yeah, it's really interesting. And I read about that. There's a medieval book on magic and science called The Picatrix. And it has a lot of moon lore in there. You might be interested in checking huh. it out. But it Picatrix. says, uh, in no uncertain terms, like eclipses are very harmful to growing plants. And it was written in Spain in, in the 10th century. And I was wondering if there was some little folkloric link between this, what this guy was telling me, this Mexican folk practice yeah. of protecting trees from eclipses and this medieval tradition, which ultimately comes from the Arab world. And I, I not to go on too long with this. Yeah. I asked his wife about this, and she said, oh yeah, when we were growing up, we weren't even allowed to go outside where we eclipse. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. Tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> yes, yeah, there Saturday. is. Um, yeah, I do remember um, when I was reading about sort of the origins of these things, that, you know, until the astrologers got down predicting when the, being able to tell when the mm. eclipses were going to happen, it was a very, like, startling, scary thing, yeah. right? Um, and so that, I mean, I know it, it, it helped a lot when they could, you know, once the calculations were such that they could tell that it was going to come. Um, but one thing people have asked me sometimes is, like, is this an Appalachian thing? Is it a... It, this is a worldwide mm -hmm. thing, so mm -hmm. just because, you know, I interviewed people in Kentucky, but like um, Susanna Lean of Madison County, she learned when she was um, in Guatemala mm -hmm. from, um, you know, from a Mayan uh, farmer there. So, she, you know, it's, it's definitely not just here um, and has roots, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> very much globally. Yes, yes, yeah, for sure. Um, have you heard of any folklore regarding the planets' effect on crops? Planets. 
question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I will say is the the place where um, this is kind of I mean. It, I'm deviating from folklore in particular, but when I was trying to look for sort of scientific basis of this stuff, so Mariah Thune did tons and tons of research. Her family continues to do that today. It's now like her grandkids and, um, and you know, a lot of really interesting and, and planetary, um, planetary conjunctions, planetary interactions are all taken into account in this biodynamic sure. almanac. So where I said that there were no universally bad signs, there are blackout periods in here where you don't do things in the garden and it's based on that. It's based on the planetary, it's, it's what's happening with all of those and how they are in relation to one another. Um, and I'll just say that like her, I mean, it's really interesting looking at that research um, that she did for decades and decades and decades. Um, you know, there are pictures of, um, you know, carrots from the same seed, right, that were planted under all the different signs, and they look very different, you know? And so it's like the ones that are the perfectly straight carrots, that became the root signs. You know, she did, I mean, I mean she looked at all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, it's just phenomenal the number of different uh, variables she looked at. What that means is that, that, is that what you have is like, bar graphs that represent, you know, one data point or, you know, like looking at it from a scientific lens, I'm like, well, where's the p-values? Where's the error bars, you know? And it's like, well, they're not there because she, there's no way she could have looked at all those different factors if she had to have replications of plots and all, you know, to be like scientifically valid. But right. it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, she, she and her family now continue to do just an amazing array of work to, that established the system, yeah. you know, um, yeah. <laughs> How do you think this project fits into the mm -hmm. landscape of current books and other types of studies that are bringing into the conversation local, traditional knowledge, and science? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I guess, um, I mean, hopefully it's, yeah, hopefully it's enriching in some way. Um, I mean, I hadn't really thought of it as sort of uh, fitting in with that um, piece. I guess, I guess there's a question of uh, indigenous and who do you count as and who, so uh, that's sort of like saying, you know, people and people in Appalachia have come from all over, right? Like we, you know, the, the um, complexity of, uh, human histories there is, is quite big. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if I have anything else to say other than uh, maybe the person that wrote that was thinking that it somehow contributes to that piece of things. I think and that's it's another thing to try. Positive, yeah, yeah you know. That's, that's wrong. <laughs> In what ways do you think this book might be helpful to people who already use the signs for planting, harvesting, and such? Yeah, so I think... Um, in that way, getting a little bit of, I mean, most people I think who do this, they have their calendar or their almanac that they use, right? And typically it's because of, you know, who they learn from or where it's available locally, you know? Um, this, I got this from Debbie Cook, the Letcher County Conservation uh, District Office puts, you know, puts this out every year, which is interesting because extension agents and such won't, um, won't necessarily say that there's anything to this, but there are some of them that do it themselves, right? Um, but, you know, everybody kind of has their calendar. Um, I don't know that people realize that they don't all line up and sort of the nuances of kind of what this is sort of based on, but not exactly and all that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> so, yeah, so that piece of things, I think, um, yeah, might be interesting for people to see. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to all right. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Lovely evening. Thank you.